There are a few differences between professional and amateur blockchain developers. And unless you know these differences, it's going to be very difficult to find your first blockchain job. The problem is that for most people, the only way to know these differences is to get an actual blockchain job. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Unless some senior developer give you some insights, like me. So in this video, I'm going to reveal all the little crispy details that you need to know in order to come across as a professional blockchain developer. If you don't know me, I'm Julian and on my channel Eat The Blocks, I teach blockchain development and how to find your first blockchain job. So first, we're going to talk of the Agile process. So in a company, typically there are several developers and we need a method to coordinate their work. So there are several methods for software development, but the Agile method is by far the most popular one. So in the Agile method, you have a project manager who coordinates everybody and you have a team of developers. So it works in sprints. So sprints are cycle of usually two to three weeks where we focus on a specific set of tasks. So it works like this. So first at the beginning of each sprint, we have a meeting to kick off the sprint. So we'll have a list of tasks that will be managed by the project manager. These tasks will be allocated to different developers. So we got to make sure that each developer will be busy during during the whole duration of the sprint. Of course, we don't want to overload any every anybody. So we need to make sure that the allocation is fair. So this meeting usually lasts one to two hours. And after that, the developers start to work on their task. And on the next days, every day, we have a daily meetup of about 15 minutes where the developers go over what have what have done the day before and what they're going to do and they talk about the any problem they face and if they are stuck then some other developer will come to help them we also can readjust the allocation of tasks if we realize that a task will be much harder than previously anticipated and after the meeting everybody goes back to working on their task and at the end of the sprint there is another meeting to conclude the sprint and during this meeting, each developer is going to go over all his tasks and explain what he has accomplished or if there was any task that he wasn't able to finish, so he need to justify himself. So this meeting is really a good time to evaluate if we gave too much work to someone or if we gave too little work. And this meeting is usually followed directly with the next kickoff meeting for the next sprint and it repeats all the time like this. So in order to fill the Agile process, we need to use a project management software. So with a project management software, you'll have different tasks that will, you will allocate to different developers. And usually we create a different column for these tasks. So you'll have one column for tasks that are not allocated to anybody, then another column for tasks that are currently worked on, then another column for tasks that are ready to be reviewed and finally another column for tasks that are finished. So you have different software that can do this. For example, you have Trello, which is a very simple software that is used by many open source projects. Then another one a little bit more advanced is Jira. So this is very popular for enterprise for really large companies. So usually developers hate Jira because it's way too complicated and I personally really hate it. And you also have another one which is a little bit less known, but which is actually super good. That's called Zen Hub. So with Zen Hub, you integrate directly with your issues on GitHub. So that's a very integrated experience and that's super easy to like filter and search through the different tasks. So I really, really recommend this one if you can have a choice. If you're a solo developer and you never use a software like this, it's useless to buy a subscription for Jira or Zen Hub. You can just create a free account on Trello, but try to structure a board with a different column that I talk about, like pending tasks, like ready for review, and, and try to create a small project where you manage these tasks for yourself so that you can have an understanding of how you would use this software in a real agile process so that next time you have an interview with a blockchain company, you don't really act surprised when they mention some project management tool. If they ask, 
if you have any experience with project management tool, you can say yes, and, and then you'll be able to uh, explain them how, how you use Trello, and, and that will be enough. So project management software is only one part of the equation, but in order to support an agile process, you also need to use Git and GitHub. So if you're a solo developer, you may have heard of Git, and maybe that you don't really use it because you don't really feel the need for it. You'll just work on your project yourself and it works really well. But once you start to work in a team, Git really becomes required. So Git and GitHub are two different things. Beginner always get confused. Git is a command line tool that you use to manage a repository of code. And GitHub is a website that was built on top of Git to facilitate collaborative work. So so if you want to be a professional blockchain developer, you will work in a team and need to be familiar with the pull request workflow. So this workflow work like this. So there will be the GitHub repo of your company. So they will add you as a contributor to this repo. So you'll be able to, to write code and push code to this repo. So first, when you get started, you download the code from the GitHub of the company to your local Git repository then you create a branch so we call this a feature branch so that's basically a way to isolate your change then you start to work on your task and at some point you you write your test everything is working fine so then you're going to push your branch to the github of your company then you're going to do a pull request so a pull request is basically a way to say hey guys I finished my work and I would like you to review my branch. So typically you'll have one or two other developer who review your changes. If they need, they require any change, they will leave some comment and they will explain you what they want you to change. So you go back to the drawing board on your laptop, you code the changes and when you're done, you push your code again and then they review your code one more time and hopefully this is good and they give you an approval. And once you have received an approval then you can merge your branch into what we call the master branch. So that's basically the main branch of code. And at this stage, your task is considered completed. And you also need to sync up with your project management software. So in your Trello, Jira or Zen Hub, then you will drag your card to the column where it says close task. And after that, you go to start your next task. So that's a typical process when you work in a team of developer at a blockchain company. So it's really important to understand the process, but another thing that you need to master is code quality. So how can we tell if someone writes some high quality code? Well, first of all, simple code is better than complex code. And that's something where beginners often make a big mistake because they think that if they write a very complex piece of code that they are the only one to understand, that's great. But actually that's not the case. Great code is code that is simple and that everybody can understand. Another thing that is very important is that less code is better than more code. So the more code you write, the more it gives you chances to, to introduce some bugs, the, the more complex it makes your, your, your code base. So typically, if you can achieve the same functionality in less code, that's better. Don't think that you're going to be rewarded by your company just because you write a lot of code. Another thing that is really important is testing, especially when we write smart contract in Solidity, because after we deploy our smart contract to the blockchain, it's not possible to change it. So before the deployment, we really need to make sure that it works exactly like intended. We need to make sure that there are no, no bugs at all. So the best way to do it is to write a comprehensive test suite. So you need to test all the different functions of your smart contract. And a great way to know that your tests are comprehensive is by using a tool for code coverage. So a code coverage tool will tell you what's the percentage of the code in your smart contract that is covered by your test. So ideally, we want a coverage of 100%. It's not the same in other area of development, for example, uh, on the web, typically for a front end in React, 100% of test coverage is a little bit extreme. You can go maybe with something like, like 90%, but the highest the code coverage, the better. 
Another thing which is really important with smart contract is security. So because we manipulate people money, we want to make sure that there is no bug and that no hacker can exploit our smart contract and steal all the money. So testing already help you to write more secure smart contract, but you also have to be familiar with the different security vulnerability of smart contract. You also need to be familiar with some security analysis tool like uh, Mithril, for example. Another thing you need to know is gas optimization. So it costs a lot of money to run a smart contract when you send a transaction to the Ethereum network, you need to pay for transaction fees. So first you write the code of your smart contract, you make sure that the main functionality is well implemented. And after you can optimize your code to make it consume less gas. And typically this requires to have a really good understanding of the Ethereum virtual machine. So blockchain development is not just smart contract, but this is also the, but the front end and how you integrate this front end with your smart contract. And to come across as a professional developer for front end, typically you also need to know how to test your code on the front end. So if you use React, there are different testing library, for example, React testing library, you also have some tools to do some integration testing. And recently I've noticed that more and more companies for the front end demand that their developers know TypeScript. So if you don't know TypeScript, that's a superset of JavaScript that introduces basically type for JavaScript. So if you target a developer position specialized in front end, it might not be a bad idea to start learning TypeScript. Another thing that is important to know is that it's better to reduce the number of dependencies. So it's really typical for JavaScript project to have this huge list in dependencies in package.json, but many times people use a package just for a very, very specific functionality and you could just write it yourself. So when you use an entire third party package, you actually bring a lot of code and in introduce security vulnerabilities. If this is for the front end, it makes the front end bundle more heavy. So you really have all the reason in the world to minimize number of dependencies to improve your code quality. So, so far I've mentioned only technical stuff, but I also want to mention some psychological elements. So the big difference between an amateur and a professional blockchain developer is that a professional will code every day. So from Monday to Friday, you need to code every day. If you stop to code for a couple of days, then when you come back to coding, maybe you start to forget some stuff. So if you really want to become a professional, it's super important that you code every day, even when you don't want to code. So that's really the big difference. An amateur will say, oh no, today I don't want to code, I'm tired, but a professional, no, he has a job to do, he, his company pays him to, to code, so he code no matter what. And another big difference psychologically is that when you are a professional blockchain developer, you have to find a solution. You are committed to find a solution. So if you're just an amateur and you go through a tutorial and things start to get complex, sometimes you just want to bail out. You say, okay, well, I, okay, well, we're going to try something else. And then you forget, you never come back. But no, if you're paid by a company, you have to find a solution. So sometime we are stuck with a problem. We, we can't find a solution right now. So you can stop momentarily. So maybe you switch to another of your tasks. Maybe you ask some help for, from your colleague, but at some point you need to come back and actually find a solution. And sometimes it can be a little bit stressful if you are really stuck. So as a professional blockchain developer, you need to accept this stress. So now you know what are the main differences between an amateur and a professional blockchain developer. So where do you go from there? Well, this is just a small part of all my tips for blockchain career advice. I have actually have a full playlist on the topics. So if you want to keep learning how you can become a professional blockchain developer, I'll see you there.